Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, currently, we have with us Hector Oron, uh, Guillaume Hover, and Steve Langashek. Uh, Hector is mostly involved in MDBM uh, stuff. Uh, Guillaume is our beloved DPKG maintainer. And Steve Langashek was. Uh, okay. <laughs> So without further ado, they will just talk about Multilib and how to deal in a proper manner. And I want to point out, and they wanted to point out, that this is actually not something where they are presenting something and you just watch. You should participate as a proposal. And actually, your input is highly welcome. Please yeah. welcome them. Hello. Hello, everybody. Um, we are here together to present a multi-arc proposal, which is um, the objective we have is uh, design. Uh, we are currently designing and implement the uh, multi-arc capable system for a squeeze release. Because um, this is the contents we are going to talk about, some definitions and some requirements we, we've been uh, discussing on some specification. And then we have some unresolved issues and we'll have some time to discuss. Uh, this is the multi-arc. <laughs> 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 okay. So, so yeah, <laughs> the Muslims did it for us, so. <laughs> 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 okay, uh, we need to define what multi-lib is in order to understand everybody. Uh, multi-lib is about co-installing um, runtime li libraries for different uh, ABI architectures. Like, like, I mean, you have a 32 and 64-bit libraries you want to have in your system. Currently, we, we have it in Debian with the EA32 libs, which is not a very good solution. It, and it's, yeah. Yeah. Uh, like. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, you also have MIPS triarc, triarc where well, you have uh, three ABIs, and it, it, this is, it doesn't work. And well, um, and then the, we have another problem, which is uh, cross compiling, which I'm um, embedded people is more concerned about is about co building and having the headers and libraries in the right place for to be able to bootstrap uh, another root file system inside your system to export to a target system like OpenMoco or other devices. And then that gathers together into multi-arc proposal. So uh, the proposal basically is to include triplet um, names into into the library paths, so you can have many architecture the libraries for many architectures in your system, and you can have this is the 64 bit and 32 bit for the e, the Intel architecture, but you can also add ARM or MIPS or whatever architecture you you like. And then there are some uh, requirements that need, need to be implemented. So the package should allow to install packages from other architectures, and that implies to modify uh, current policy with uh, new fields, l like multi-arc field. And uh, the multi-arc field has uh, some values you can pick, like uh, same, that's for the same architecture, and foreign is the, the 
the foreign architecture, it's plain by, by the name. And then we just introduced an uh, allowed in, uh, tag for some cases <coughs> that, that we will we'll go through it later for like interpreters, like Python, like depends on, the Python ha can have two-way dependencies, but we'll, we'll go through this later. Um, these are the control fields, some of the requirements. I don't know if you want to go by one by one, or you just can read it, or if you have some questions, can ask. The thing is, yeah. It doesn't say in the specification in the why we chose to do um, uh, uh, lib triplet as opposed to use a triplet lib. Now, I, I'm very seen people have good reasons for that, but it will be useful for someone to explain to everyone why it's that way around. Is this one on? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, right. Actually, I was wondering if anybody had that question. Why, why we're not just doing by arch or something like that? Um, closer? Is this close enough? Okay. Um, so, right. So, the, the the FHS solution and the LSB solution that exists for this, which is implemented by other Linux distributions, is BiArch, which mean which lets you use a lib32 path. So, so why use lib triplet? No. Why? No. Why, why? Use, why not keep the ex Oh, why, why not use the existing cross compiler toolchain style path? Use, use a triplet. Lib, use a triplet and, and then there's just a <coughs> prefix on the beginning and the file system of cross install stuff looks the same as it does everywhere else. As opposed to having the triplet after the lib or the user include making right. our lives complicated. Um, part of that was because there are in in principle you could have cross installation of executables as well as cross installation of libraries. And the architecture qualified paths that are used for cross compilation mean something different in that case for executables because cross the cross the cross build paths you do have executables under there that are related to like G GCC and whatnot and those paths don't imply that the binary you're installing there is that the host or that the, the build architecture is that ABI it implies that the, the host architecture is that ABI. So in order to avoid that inconsistency and ambiguity, um, given that possibly eventually we would want co-installability of executables with magic paths, that, that was, I, I think that was the original rationale. That's at least my reason for not trying to use that. Um, Tal uh, Foghen is the original uh, proponent, well, I guess I, I guess there's some dispute about that. My, he was the first one who spoke to me about it, but he 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 did the paper for his uh, his doctoral work, wasn't it? That his master's work. He was uh, well. That's a lot louder now, isn't it? Um, Tolafoghan had had written up the paper that proposed this, and and he was who introduced me to that. But unfortunately, he's not here, so I I can't really speak to why it was done that way originally, other than you know, half remembered rationales from th uh, third parties? Uh, I think the main reasons, uh, one was uh, to not pollute the root, uh, file, uh, the root directory. So because w if we need to uh, have multi-arch libraries uh, for uh, slash lib, then you will have to have the triplet in like root slash lib. Uh, sorry, a triplet uh, slash lib and then the... Yeah, but yeah. So uh, if you end up having four or five uh, architectures uh, in your system, then you you have you are polluting the the, the root uh, directory. That was one reason. And then yeah, because uh, currently the 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 triplet under user, so the cross uh, or sysroot uh, way of doing this is that uh, you have the whole. Uh, it's like it's it's a, a ch root. So you have there everything. So you will have to pull out the the uh, slash leap somewhere else. So 
that, but I think the main reason was to not pollute the, the user and uh, root directories. Okay, we'll go on. And uh, uh, some packages would need to adapt with these uh, tags. And then we are thinking on a smooth uh, plan for trans transition without having to break the system. So you have just uh, manual configure your package manager and uh, you have a multi-arc um, system. This is the, the Python case I, I was talking about where you have a some packages that can are uh, depend depend on the uh, on the interpreter, and then there are others that are, are libraries that also depend in the same package. In the, in this case, you you, you need to dif differ differentiate. So um, that's we introduced the, a package like Python should be marked with the allowed flag and uh, it depend and dependency we we add uh, a new field it's a uh, two, do two dots and, and the any i don't know you want to explain this so better. one one of the, uh, the reasons uh, when we were uh, going through the uh, uh, cases that we could uh, uh, want to use uh, multi arts uh, the obvious case is the shared libraries with uh, which uh, before uh, there was a, a slide so we use same because uh, you have a, a binary and then you have the shared library which should match the architecture and that's the trivial the obvious case then we have the other one which is uh, the foreign value which is uh, uh, when you are calling a uh, uh, for example, when you're calling uh, a binary or when, when you have a, a script to interpret. And uh, for those, it doesn't matter if the uh, interpreter is one architecture and the script, uh, script is uh, another one, or if you are invoking uh, a binary from another architecture. And then the third case was when you had a binary which could either interpret or load uh, a binary into its own other space. So in this case, we cannot use the same uh, we cannot use the same field value because uh, otherwise uh, we w well we have to choose between either semantics. So uh, we don't want to uh, change the semantics for the dependencies. So they should not lose uh, 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 they should not lose uh, uh, I mean, yeah, they should not be looser than they are currently right now. So uh, for the interpreter case, uh, we mark the, the interpreter itself, and then uh, we mark each package which we want to have a looser dependency. Well, us uh, describing it at the time was that uh, multi arch was a field we set on the package nodes themselves, whereas allowed lets you lets you annotate the dependency arc rather than just the package that's the target of the dependency. Um, I don't know if that helps uh, other people think about it, but it helps me. Um, that that works. Uh, that works for. I mean, yeah, that works for the shared library and for the for the. Uh, so for the same and foreign values, but for uh, the interpreter, one of the options was not to mark it as multi arch and then just mark the packages that could be uh, using the interpreter uh, by calling it or by being interpreted. So uh, one of the reasons that uh, uh, we added the allowed value is so that we can control when an interpreter uh, is is actually multi arch and, uh, and other people cannot uh, add dependencies to any other architecture without the, in the interpreter uh, allowing it. So I'm not sure if that makes sense. Or yeah. it makes sense to me, but I know what you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So. Well, um, we'll continue, and we also have the architecture independent files the config files, documentation files, and data files. So uh, the package will implement uh, internal database and will check uh, 
it'll do the reference counting and check if, if the file is already there. And um, we should maybe think about if if we have some differences. And uh, at the time that uh, we discussed this, uh, we checked a bit uh, what was the, the current use for uh, mostly it is going to, to be used for user share uh, doc, for example. So uh, what my effect. Uh, uh, that the files not being same on different architectures could be timestamps for some. So we should probably like review if there's any case where we might want to share the same uh, file across, uh, or that that file uh, might be different on different architectures. But uh, at least the, the cases we consider, they are compressed and they should not carry a, a timestamp and they should just be the same. So, but that's something to to check beforehand. Otherwise, the other option is just to split those into a common package that can be shared across other architectures. Yeah, we we already faced this problem with the GDB debugger uh, for cross installations which you have to overwrite the manual page and when you try to install it it fails because the man page is already there from the native debugger so this would help in, in these cases and um, the future of uh, BARC packages uh, there are some cases that uh, we need to st still have some BARC packages and in case like GCC multilib uh, to be able to these packages need, need to be need to continue to be to be cross-built, cross I mean. I, I guess I'd case. like to expand on that a little bit here. Um, so one of the, the requirements that we put in place for this spec, so everything we're describing here was actually, it's the outcome of a session that we had at the Ubuntu Developer Summit this past uh, May in Barcelona. Um, it was a very convenient uh, opportunity to get these guys together since, you know, Two of the three people up here are local to Spain, and, and we had a number of other Debian folks at, at UDS and, and Ubuntu folks who were interested in this topic, so we got together and hashed out this spec there at the time. Um, and one of the, the requirements we put in place for the initial um, implementation here is that it not require archive side changes. So when we talk about BIARC packages continuing to be supported in, in the archive, that's because the only way to get away from those is by allowing cross-architecture dependencies or build dependencies in the archive. So that means a whole lot of archive side work that we'd have to be done and make this happen. And to avoid that, at least in the first round, we, we've conceded that we have to keep some of these packages around where we have an AMD64 package that ships 32-bit code, which means we need a GCC that can build 32-bit code as, as part of its main GCC package, the GCC-multilib package here, uh, and things of that nature. And then uh, for APT, it would you just add uh, the f uh, field with in bra brackets or this kind of sign, uh, the architecture you want for, for your system in the sources list. And also, you have to extend a, a command line six syntax and without uh, in the colon preceding the version. Then we have the unsolved issues, which are the develop the dev packages, which are the mostly headers and, and some libraries. And this is a concern for cross compiling, and we are still uh, talking about how how should we handle uh, these kind of packages. And uh, there's uh, another issue like. Uh, we could we could have uh, co-installable package uh, executables, so y you can run those executables by uh, this uh, virtualization layer provided by uh, Bean uh, FMT uh, kernel module, like KMU people does. Uh, but this is like this is out of the scope of of this implementation that that could come afterwards. And um, it would be nice also to have uh, auto, auto detection of, of the ABI you are running. And you can run uh, nth for MIPS N32 or O32 code or 64-bit uh, uh, code. Um, we are also. There, there's also um, a proposal to have partial architecture to to keep uh, the other ABIs packages 
like these architectures do need to be uh, complete and uh, also for embedded bootstrapping to be able to generate like UCLIPC uh, root file systems or bootstrap exotic architecture like SH4 or or other architectures but that Debian doesn't really want to have in the archive but at least you are able to to bootstrap it if you if you want and also uh, having uh, cross architecture dependencies this is uh, right now we are not handling that but it would be nice so it's an unsolved issue now we can discuss about all all, all this we're proposing and uh, i we have this is the current layout we have in our in our system where you have all this uh, EA32 uh, stuff. This is really a mess. And, uh, and then the, uh, under user triplet, we, we have our uh, cross-building stuff. Like the binaries includes uh, all that. And then the, this proposal uh, aims to, to use this kind of paths and having uh, uh, libraries under library triplet and the include files could be under user include triplet and have the compilers and everything uh, li linkers uh, look in there and uh, but uh, this this is a concern for cross compiling we we are not sure if this is this is the right way of doing things and we think this is an important thing and we want to really have the good solution, but uh, we don't know. We need to do a lot of testing and and see ho how it works. And this is like uh, another another proposal for cross compiling. Like for cross compiling, it's good to to. It's about having a root file system in, inside your root file system, which is called sysroot, system root. You, you can pass that to the, the autocom, the auto tools, or, or any build system, and uh, and he knows where where uh, the system, the build system know, knows where it needs to go to to be able to cross build. So it, it would be maybe for cross compiling having a sysroot not under opt but here it's there, and having a dependency in the vendor and the triplet. And inside there, you populate it with all all the stuff you need for your target machine, which doesn't have to do anything with the host machine libraries, because you you might want to have some libraries without X support, but in your system you have X support and things like that. And well, we we need to thank uh, Debian, Ubuntu, and Mdebian people, and many individuals that has been involved in a lot of talking and deciding things and this is not something we just wrote up in right now and showing to you and there is more people involved in this and uh, any comments suggestions patches whatever you we have picked the uh, debian package list and if you you want to you haven't read the specification we have we have it under ubuntu wiki and you can get this presentation by cloning uh, and debian git repository and uh, that's it you know you so you said earlier that one of the outstanding items was dash dev packages there in your list of paths you've got um triplets under user include, so what is there there that still needs to be done? We don't know because we haven't actually looked at it. That's why it's just li listed as out of scope for the initial implementation so to avoid actually having to spend the effort to figure out if there are pieces missing. Um, it may be that there's nothing missing other than just installing things in that path. We, we simply haven't really evaluated it in uh, fully to the point where we were willing to specify it and say yes, this is how it's going to work. So it was really just an issue of limiting the scope of the in initial implementation so we had something that we could go ahead and implement and 
and we didn't see that uh, the dev packages would have any impact on the package management implementation. So we just said, yeah, we'll leave that for later. Everything that's listed on that list of unresolved issues are basically things that we know there are people in the community um, that some of us want to do these these kinds of things or somebody else in the community has an interest in doing this and we're expecting them to all be areas of future work on this and if anybody has an interest in one of those I certainly encourage you to work on that and build on this work. So that leads on to my next question which is what bits are left to do before we can release this in squeeze and how can we make it happen? <laughs> so the uh, as Steve has said, like, uh, what we have been focused or trying to focus on is to uh, get the basics for the runtime so that we can get a system that can use this. And uh, we have also tried to consider things that might uh, imply changes in the future. So that's why uh, we have been talking about the, the cross tool chain case and uh, we have been thinking about this. So it's not something we have uh, not thought about completely, but something we have not focused our energy to, to to think about. So that's why we want to present this uh, to a wider audience to see if there's anything that uh, essential for the, uh, the minimal implementation that we might really want to, to put there that might block uh, later on uh, to, to extend it to, to like wider users. And uh, yeah, well, uh, to ask, uh, to answer your, your question, uh, for Squeeze, we will need uh, dpkg support, APD support, and then uh, we probably want uh, most of the base system switch to multi-arch. So that will be part of the tool chain for libgcc, uh, and then glibc, and then few other libraries that are like required. Because uh, one of the main points is that we want these to be an extension. So uh, we want to be able to incrementally add the support and not, not require that we upload everything on a flag day. So once the, uh, the basic stuff is there, you should be able to start uh, adding support for multi-arch in the upper layers. So. Yeah, I really congratulate you for deciding to try and do this in an incremental way instead of a you know flip a bit on the world kind of way. I think that's essential to having this actually happen in our lifetimes. Um, I, I <laughs> well, you know, I I will apologize once again publicly to everybody who's had to deal with it at all for the existence of I thirty two libs and all of the horror that has created. Um, and you know, those of you who don't know the history um, really should study it because it's an excellent example of nothing lives so long as a temporary hack. But um, you know, I, I, I just I want to sort of voice my encouragement and enthusiasm for this. Uh, like Steve, I've, I found this very frustrating. Um, I participated in some discussions actually in Malaga many years ago now um, with Talif and others about some of the you know initial thoughts that led down this chain of, of inquiry. And I'm really pleased to see you guys closing in on something. If there's anything that I or others who care about this can do to help bring this to closure in time for inclusion in the squeeze release, please let us know, even at a minimal sort of, you know, uh, solve the, the, the interesting executables case level only. I think it would be absolutely wonderful to get this in. And uh, my quick look through on the material that you've got, I don't see any glaring holes. There is, one of the challenges with def dash dev packages is that they are um, historically um, combinations of architecture specific and architecture independent content. And so one of the things that we might ponder doing as we go forward is refactoring some of those dash dev packages so that you know, we don't have the situation of a single package that simultaneously wants to behave like an arch ending and an arch you know, specific. Um, package, but I don't see anything in the structure structure that you've got here that should get in the way of doing something clueful with that. Um, yeah. Two questions. Uh, first, is there any uh, Linux distribution at all that currently implements multi arch and not by arch? No. Okay. <laughs> this is Debian innovating once again. <laughs> um, we're also breaking the FHS by doing this, so we'll have to amend the FHS once we're done. <laughs> Be before this goes into the archive, there'll be a policy patch. Uh, as it should be. This is an excellent example of how the um, My second question is, what is the overall goal? Do we plan to have the entire archive be able to use multi-arch by time 
I like get the base in for squeeze and then have maybe for squeeze plus one, basically every library in the pat archive be able to use on multi arch. Well, as I said before, uh, one of the main goals was to make it incremental. So uh, if there's no need for uh, really not use libraries to be uh, multi-arch enabled, then there's no point in, in doing the work. So uh, one of the nice things is it. Uh, we can just switch whatever we need. We don't have to switch the whole archive. So I mean, if there's people doing the work and it makes sense, yeah, sure. But uh, that was one of the main points, that we should be able not to switch the whole thing. Uh, I think it's definitely an open-ended transition. Um, getting like 5% of the library packages converted over takes care of 95% of the pain that we live with today as far as BIARC packages on Debian and Ubuntu. Um, it's it's open-ended. I think eventually we'll get to the point where if multi-arch succeeds, if we get a base system that works, we'll start seeing this being done by default in the helper packages. CDBS and DHMake are going to start hopefully using this by default and then we'll see gradually over time all libraries will use it but I don't really see any need to set a fixed schedule for that it's it's really you know if we get if we get the base system for squeeze we're all going to be a lot happier dropping the by arch packages would mean that we lose uh, the 64 bit uh, support for architectures where we have a 32 bit user land but 64 bit kernels is there any partial architectures? Uh, Spark S390. Yes, partial architectures. Uh, okay. That's a, a one of our unresolved issues. Um, and partial architectures it, it, it is a feature that depends on the archive changes that would be needed in order to drop the BIARC packages anyway. So mm -hmm. once the archive changes are in place, there's no reason not to do the partial architectures, in my opinion, because it's really straightforward at that point to implement those once the archive changes are done. Uh, I, I want to uh, comment on uh, Matthias' uh, uh, answer, uh, quest, uh, question. So uh, we have been talking about uh, the by arch and uh, case oh, and the tool chain stuff, and uh, there's some uh, weird cases uh, by having. I mean, if we keep the by arch uh, uh, libraries and the multi arch ones, there may be some cases we may end up with the same content in different packages. So you may end up uh, having lib64 uh, GCC and then libgcc from the other, the foreign architecture. But uh, I think we should, for now, ignore this case because uh, m most of the uh, li uh, packages in Debian using libgcc from the foreign architecture are not going to be using the Byarch one. So Byarch is mostly going to be used privately by people building using the, the uh, tool chain for the current architecture targeting the other one. So I think for now we just can't ignore ignore that case and just assume that it will work. So, Hi, uh, my question is, uh, what will this break? Um, you, you, you are taking care of the implementation um, and you seem to be doing a very good job of it, but I can imagine that there will be some, some cases where a package doesn't work when you install um, a multi-arch version of it, like, uh, something like uh, loading plugins from a hard-coded directory and things like that. Is there a way you can, you can spot these issues because you're not necessarily running in a BIOC uh, environment? Right. So as far as plugin paths and, and things of the sort, um, it's not been explicit in the spec and I, Ian has requested that we make it more explicit. Uh, changing these paths is something we expect to do in the source packages. So we're going to be changing the source packages so that they are built to look for things under these paths and built to install under these paths um, natively in the source and not using, there have been various schemes proposed in the past where dpackage would remap at install time, which runs into the plugin path problem. Um, so since this, this conversion is being done on a per source package basis and it requires somebody to actually touch the package to make it happen, um, it should not break anything. Uh, there will be cases where <laughs> where you'll be able to install libraries in a cross-architecture environment where they haven't been tested um, because all the dependencies are there. You don't have the native version of the package installed. You just install the, the cross-arc version and it may or may not work because nobody's touched that package yet. But it shouldn't break anything that works today with this implementation. Um, and 
there was a part of that that I was thinking for some reason I should have you follow up on it, and I don't remember what it was, something about... Uh, I think it comes back to our RPATH discussion earlier, if you want to cover that. I just want to clarify that uh, the if something breaks, that should be a packaging issue. So the tool chain should work transparently, and the, the package management uh, tools, they should also work transparency, uh, transparently. So if, if an application is not able to load the plugins from the correct path, then that's uh, as if right now you will place the plugins in a path that the application is not looking for. So. Right, so the, the comment is that packages today, library packages, could anticipate this multi-arch change by going ahead and starting to use those directories, the user lib triplet and the user include triplet for their installation because the tool chain pieces are in place where everything will look in the right place for that. The only thing that won't work today is you won't actually be able to co-install them. So you could, we could convert glibc today to use those paths. Um, but then dpackage and apt wouldn't actually let you install the foreign version anyway, so it doesn't actually get you very far until we have the, the uh, package manager in place. So I, I just wanted to say that I, I've seen so many of these multi-arch proposals over the years, and, and I'm just, I'm always very critical about almost anything. <laughs> and, and I just wanted to say that I think this is a really good idea. Um, I've got a, a few sort of minor quibbles, um, but by and large, um, I'm just looking forward to it. <laughs> I'm sorry to be out of character. <laughs> Do you want my quibbles now? Sure. Right, so, so I, had, I had kind of two, two comments. Um, uh, the first one is that um, you might get somewhere useful by um, having a conventional sim link that loops the native arch triplet, whatever you decide that is, back into slash lib. Um, and that would mean that no files on a normal i386 system would actually move. And that might, well, firstly, it, it, it's sort of politically easier because you don't have to explain anything to anybody. And it might stop some things that currently work from breaking because the file moved and the code hadn't been changed to look in the new place. Um, I don't know what you think of that. I probably need to think about some more. So while you were talking, I just now thought of a, of a case that that breaks, which was actually one of our um, use cases in the spec, which is the idea of live migrating a system from one architecture to another. <laughs> I, I don't see that there's necessarily a problem with that. You just have to uh, shuffle some files about. Right, without, without the aid of the package manager to do that then. Right, but uh, after you were done, it would all be in the place you expected it to be. <laughs> it's, it's a possibility. Uh, sorry, the, uh, in the discussion in Barcelona, I think that uh, you suggested, are you... Somebody mentioned that Fedora had a bug where they accidentally cross-graded a system to a different architecture, and it. Im oh. I think we said at the time that if we do that, do, that if we could do that, we knew we, that we had won. But uh, it might be prudent to include to build in some kind of protection against that and require a little bit of manual effort to do that <laughs> kind of thing. So I don't know that I'm entirely opposed to it requiring something outside of the package manager to change the native architecture. I'd like it to be something a little smoother than having to identify all the files under user lib that have to be moved aside so that you can cleanly uh, uh, cross upgrade. Um, yeah, now, now, making it difficult, not wanting to do it by accident, um, uh, certainly understandable. Um, it's not a frivolous use case. We actually talked about this when the ARML port was getting started, about whether this was the right way to handle upgrades from ARM to ARML, and we ended up having other things in place at the time that, that actually made more sense for ARM being as embedded of an architecture as it was at the time, where you didn't want to have two full file systems worth of data. 
So, so one possible way to do this is to only have this symbling on old systems that predate the whole multi-arch proposal, and that way people with old systems don't have to complain, and people with new systems get shiny new cross-gradable ones. It's just, I think this needs to be thrashed out in a bit of a smaller setting than this, really. I'll surely there's... Or, or the, the really simplifying assumption of just create a tiny package that delivers that set of sim links, you know, for, that, that's configurable for a given architecture, and if you want the backwards compatibility, install that package, and if you want to live in a brave new world, don't install that package. Would we install that by default on upgrades then, and should it be, just be base files then at that point? Now that was one of your quibbles. Yeah, I had one other quibble, which was um, about the, the DPGIG having checksums. Now I know that lots of people want DPGIG to have checksums for, for other reasons. I'm not wholly opposed to that, but it does involve um, some extra disk space and make the file database bigger and stuff like that. So um, you could solve that same problem of detecting installation of erroneously different files just by comparing the file that's there already with the one that you're installing. Yeah, but then you have to compare all the files. I mean, say you have four arch architectures, then you have to compare like each one against the other ones. So if you have the checksums already, then you just compare the checks. Uh, sorry, the yeah, hashes or whatever. Just compare the, the hashes, or you just do hashes once. You know that they're all successfully installed, so you need to compare against the last one that was installed. Yeah, yeah, three. Sorry, you know that you know that you've already <laughs> installed the previous three successfully, and therefore you can trust that DeepCourage has already done the right thing and compared the previous ones. Right. So it means you need to do them iteratively, but you don't need to remember the previous checksums. Yes, so the, keeping the checksum around would be somewhat of an optimization in the case where you have a larger number of architectures installed because you don't have to recompute the checksum each time you are installing a new architecture. On the other hand, the number of packages where you're actually going to have to care about that is probably small enough that, you know, six of one, half dozen of the other. Right. And presumably the question is whether the overhead of doing comparison per file is uh, greater than or less than the overhead of storing a checksum for every single hundred th couple of hundred thousand files on the whole system, which you would have to do. Well, right now we already have, most of the packages in Debian already have the MD5 sum, uh, True. sums already. So, True. Uh, I don't know, just, uh, w yeah, the problem is that the package doesn't have the guarantee that, pa that the package will provide that file. So the package will have to make sure that Either it well right. it, at installation time it, it produces the the hash and then probably we mm. want the package to do that as well at build time up until right the real, so. the real difference is not I think in terms of disk space but in terms of how much memory and startup time the package uses reading it all yeah sure you you could require only the you could use the the existing MD five sums file that's in all the packages most of the packages anyway and um, just say that if you have a multi-arch package, you have to have one of those MD5 sums. Except for the uh, build uh, daemon bug we had recently in Ubuntu where the MD5 sums for a number of .desktop files were being changed after DH MD5 sums was run. Yes. <laughs> yeah. But we needed to fix that anyway. Oh, yes. I'm yeah, just saying it's not necessarily a good idea for dpackage to rely on. At least not for now. So, uh, yeah, one, one of the... Uh, thoughts, uh, at least for now, is that uh, I don't think Dpackage can trust the MD5 sums from the packages. And if we have, for now, as a transition period, uh, we make Dpackage uh, produce those at in, uh, installation time, or at least verify that they, they match, and then the build tools, they produce them, then after, say, a release cycle, we can just, like, or if we mark those as, like, trustable, then we can stop uh, doing the checks in Dpackage itself. So. I mean that's that's probably optimizations. I mean, yeah. I, as I say, this is all like quibbles, really, isn't it? Might be best dealt with on a mailing list. Yeah. Just a quick question: Is the Debian multi-arch mailing list then officially dead? 
Is there such a thing? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I, well, I don't know. It's not. Uh, yeah. There's we. An the yes, there's a, there's an Alioth mailing list um, uh, for the Multi Arch project, which uh, is. It, it seems like that at least for this part, for this spec, it makes more sense to have this discussion within the deep, the context of the deep package development community, um, rather than a standalone mailing list, uh, which, in fact, I'm not sure any of us are subscribed to. <laughs> yeah, uh, on that point, I just did want to. You, can you bring that URL up where the uh, the spec is again? Um, you, you don't want to just Google for Debian multi arch uh, because you get half a dozen random old proposals, all of which are mutually contradictory and out of date. Um, and you, you have to find this URL, uh, and uh, at some point, some kind-hearted person is going to have to go around and chase up all these old things and make them say, actually, this is dead now. Yeah, yeah, I thought somebody would say that. <laughs> Does policy have a significant amount of Google foo? Is what you're saying there? Uh, does anyone actually use Google to find policy or search anyone? <laughs> <laughs> is is uh, because we? Uh, I'm not sure if anyone uh, or most of you have read uh, the spec, so and we went through it uh, pretty fast. Uh, I guess we are going to uh, post. Uh, post it on uh, the mailing list and uh, look for uh, reviews and comments. But uh, if there's anything that uh, was not clear from like or fast explanation, it would be nice if just you bring it up. So. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, yeah. is anyone here like, do, do you have any doubts or do you want something to be uh, detailed or explained or <laughs> I don't think so. I um, already asked and he said, uh, <laughs> Let's see. Uh, I just thought it might be useful to say something about the cross compiling section of this, which, as you say, is explicitly out of spec for today because, in the interest of getting something done ever. So I wouldn't say it's out of spec for today. No. It's out of scope for the, the original spec, which is step one. I'm happy for us to use some of this time talking about where we go from here and what, what bits we should do next and, and brainstorm yeah. about those. Yeah, we care about the things right now that if this isn't going to work further down the line, we should fix it now because otherwise it's going to be very painful. Now, having been thinking about this for a while, uh, my personal conclusion is that I think we can use this for cross-building uh, yeah, that. Um, so long as everything is in lockstep, you are only building the exact same uh, thing uh, as the Debian version for the thing you've got installed. Um, so yeah, all you're doing is changing the architecture, you're not changing anything else. Um, as soon as you want to change anything else, dependencies, versions, um, uh, you know, you're actually building for an embedded thing and you want to pare things down a bit, we've got to use something else, which I think is the, uh, probably the better suggestion is the sysroot scheme, but we still have, because you need a whole load of Arch independent files which might be different. And, and I don't think we can do that with... Well, we could do it with an infinite array of triplets throughout our file system, but I, I'm not sure that's a good thing. But so. uh, we have discussed this uh, before, and if, if you are targeting a different system, then that's, that's not Debian anymore. So if you try to mix them, that might work or not, but uh, yeah. yeah. Right, so if you're cross-compiling cross to something that's not Debian, what are your libraries doing in Userlib anyway? That, that's an FHS violation, and... I'll write you a ticket for it later. <laughs> User arm triplet is also not in the FHS. So the fact that you're doing that is, eh, we, we, we turn a blind eye to it. Right, it, it, well, right. So, so this is an example of how not to do it the multi-arch way that, you know, for, for things that are not, Doing, if, you're, if you're targeting something that's not a Debian system, it shouldn't be in user lib anyway because it's not going to be part of the Debian package management. Uh, it can be in slash opt if that's appropriate. If they're third-party vendor packages, then, then opt may be appropriate. User local may be appropriate. Any of those things may be appropriate, and, and yeah. I was just going to say that the, the 
it is very important that Debian is good at cross-building and is a good cross-building platform. And you know, in the real world, you are often targeting something slightly different from what you're building on, uh, and that is you know a big deal for a lot of people who actually, you know, amazingly, even with the current infrastructure, people use this quite a lot, uh, and there's all sorts of of cruddiness. Um, so you know that is a big deal, and I think everybody recognises that. Uh, that there's complicated questions about what the slickest way to achieve it all is. Right. What, one of the things that really kind of falls out of multi-arch is that cross-compiling doesn't really, is, is not really any different than the native compiling. And now if you're targeting something which is not your standard Debian packages, you put it somewhere else in the file system, you can still use the multi-arch directory hierarchy within that context, um, be that in slash opt or user local or whatever it might be. Um, and it's symmetric all the way around. Um, and, and your distinction there is not, oh, I'm cross-compiling versus building natively. It's, oh, I'm building for something that's not managed by the package manager. Carrying on slightly from uh, from that, uh, has anybody, tr this is a bit of an open-ended question, sorry. Uh, has anybody tried to uh, make some kind of educated guess on the impact on binaries that don't come from Debian? Uh, presumably, the well-behaved binaries must continue to work, otherwise we'll be creating a flag day for ourselves. But there are plenty of non-well-behaved binaries that you... I heard our path mentioned earlier on. Uh, there are plenty of non-well-behaved binaries that our path themselves that load plugins manually from weird places. Has anybody thought of uh, either a way to... preferably a way to deal with those transparently or uh, ways to document, have a marketing campaign, and why you shouldn't do that, etc. Well, yes, Ian's suggestion for symlinking the native directory back to the uh, user lib uh, deals with that. Uh, I'm not content with that solution, but yes, people have thought about it. I wanted to say something about cross-compiling, because it's true that you can't, in general, build on a Debian system a package that's targeted at something other than the Debian system you're building on. But that doesn't mean that cross-building isn't important. We all do a lot of cross-building. Um, we cross-build packages for different releases of Debian. And I think we should also think, you know, include in, you know, along with the uh, rah, rah, universal operating system, we should, we should be thinking very hard about how we can make people be able to cross-build their Debian derivatives, uh, maybe for a different CPU architecture, maybe because they've got some other purpose in mind and so they've got some set of changes they want to make to Debian. After all, we are in the business of making free software and the point of free software is that you can modify it. And if that involves rebuilding everything, you should be able to do that too. Well, the standard mechanism today for building for a different uh, release is using a Trut or a VM and I think that's I don't think multi-arch changes anything in that regard. Um, it just means you can have a Trut which also has uh, another foreign architecture inside of it. Right. Uh, I'm being flagged that we are short on time here. We've got three minutes left. Is that what that means? I was going to offer you. Know, you said, Steve, that you weren't terribly satisfied with the sort of top-level symlink package thingy. Um, you should be at least as satisfied with that as you are with the notion that somebody's running foreign binaries on the system. So. <laughs> I mean, if, somebody, if somebody's willing to subject themselves to the whims of somebody else's binary-only software releases, then a few symlinks to keep it working seems pretty trivial to me. <laughs> sure, but having those symlinks installed by default in such a way that they break my uh, architecture upgrade case... Uh, you keep using this word default, and to me that's, like okay. the, that's the horrible worst case. <clears throat> it's, well, it's the thing you install if you insist on belts and suspenders when neither are necessary. One of the problems with that is that uh, it might be more difficult to catch up uh, packaging uh, absolutely, errors. Absolutely, absolutely true. And so it's one of the reasons I don't like it as a default is yeah, yeah. that I think if you're going to change this, that you know, the, the right thing to do is to, to, to not keep those crutches around if you don't need to. Yeah, sure. So, uh, I mean, if someone wants to package such thing and it doesn't get installed or pulled by default by anything, then, uh, yeah, I guess it should be okay. But I, I would rather not see this like 
on normal installations. I also think, you know, we have to be careful about being worried about the effort involved. And the reason I say that is that there's always this issue when we contemplate things like this that might have a ripple effect through lots of packages. We seem to get very hung up over the how much time and effort it's going to take to get through a transition. The reality in my experience is that if we come up with good technical solutions and we get a few key essential things working in the new environment and people see it and recognize that, oh yeah, this really does work and it solves a problem and it's not all that hard to do, um, that's when people find themselves enabled and motivated to dogpile on and actually do the work of pushing the rest of it through. So my suspicion is if we get this working at all in a releasable form for Squeeze, that Squeeze plus one is likely to be, you know, a reasonable goal for completing whatever transition we think needs to be completed, and I'm not worried about that. Okay, well, we've had time called on us, so uh, thank you all for coming. It's been a good discussion. Um, and I hope we have some more good hallway track discussions about multi-arch over the course of the, the week we're all here. Um, please don't disturb Guillem with your questions, because he should be working on the implementation. But I'll be happy to be his secretary and, and uh, field any questions you might have. <laughs>